This is Call the Psychiatrist, the show where psychiatrists answer your questions. I'm Dr. David Hanley. And I'm Dr. Abby Snavely. In this episode, our listener is looking for ideas on how to approach a friend with paranoid delusions. Say you like me, you better count the ways. Just a quick reminder. Listening to this podcast does not mean we have a doctor-patient relationship. Our intention is to educate and entertain you. Nothing we say is intended or recommended as a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your own physician or other qualified healthcare professional regarding any medical questions or conditions. I was going to say, you should maybe call a qualified healthcare provider about your current condition (laughs) because (laughs) you don't sound so hot, my friend. (laughs) It's going to be fine. It is fine. Wait, no, if you wait long I enough, mean, everything resolved. Right. Either by death or some other way. Yeah. I mean, right. The natural right. course of things is to either get better or get worse. That's right. <laughs> it's profound. We'll find out. This could be our last episode. <laughs> Watch out. Let's make it a good one. Our first question is from a listener who wishes to remain anonymous. The person identified themselves as a faithful listener. So I guess we can call her Faith. Love it. A friend I've had for over 30 years is going through a traumatic divorce. She seemed to be coping okay and going to counseling twice a week, but she seems to have snapped recently and has been extremely paranoid that everyone is out to get her and even kill her. She no longer goes to counseling because she doesn't trust her. Anyone who tells her she needs help all of a sudden is part of this imaginary group out to get her. There have been some suspicious things occurring, but 99% of what she thinks is happening is just in her head. If I tell her she needs help, then I will suddenly become part of the problem in her mind. So I just listen on occasion and try to inject logical thinking into the conversation. I know I can't help her, but is there a way to suggest something beneficial to her without her thinking I'm also part of this group to take her down? Can trauma cause paranoid personality disorder? She has every symptom. If she doesn't seek help soon, I'm afraid her life will be more like a movie where the ending will be her carted off to the locked psych ward screaming, I'm not crazy. Uh, I mean, that does still happen, doesn't it? Uh, admissions that to a people, locked unit. Yeah. It does still happen. I was like, I don't know if that's the beginning or the end of the movie, but uh, it depends on which side you want to follow the drama. But there's plenty, it sounds like, is all I'm saying. Ooh. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's dramatic. Sometimes it is necessary. But I wanted to acknowledge that uh-huh. uh, just in the phrasing there, there's clearly some discomfort yeah. about the unknown, but I understand the concern. And I don't mean to make light of that, but. Well, it's, you know, they painted a picture for a reason. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Also, we appreciate this person sitting in the question. It's a good reminder that psychiatric conditions affect everybody, you know, families, friends, caregivers. Good point. Although, unlike physical illnesses, there's so much stigma around the topic that caregivers usually get a lot less support than they otherwise would. So it's hard. It's hard to find resources. It's hard to get help when somebody you know is going through something like that. Yeah. So Faith is trying to be a good friend, which I respect. So I'm reading two questions here. Uh, The first one is, what's the diagnosis and what are good interventions by family and friends for somebody Mm -hmm. with paranoid delusions? And regardless of the diagnosis, the interventions are going to be the same, but why don't we start with the diagnosis? We don't have a lot of information, obviously. Um, So this feels a bit like an academic exercise, but, you know, I think we can see what we can do with this. Maybe it'll be fun. It might be. I mean, it might be fun. I don't. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Dave, but I was in the last class of psychiatrists to be forced to take an oral board exam. So I like to think that, you know, my age or my era is the last real psychiatrist, but I don't know what, <laughs> what you might think about that. Yeah. Why did they get rid of it? I don't, I just, I don't know why we would not have that, but anyway, it's I mean, fun. it was, it, <laughs> it's so fun. They, I had to go to Portland we all had to get on a bus in the morning to be driven to a undisclosed location, <laughs> which turned out to be the Portland VA for me. Um, but I guess they just didn't want us to study up ahead of time. It was all very bizarre. All right. I'm going to make two assumptions based on the question stem. Okay, great. I mean, just the question. It's not an exam. <laughs> There's no question stem. It's just a question. <laughs> okay, Dr. Hanley, what is your differential? <laughs> all right. So the first assumption is about <laughs> age. <laughs> Uh, uh-huh. So they've been friends for 30 years. So that means uh-huh. the person in the question is at least 30. I think we could That's assume right. 35 if we agree that nursery friends are pretty rare. So sure. at least 35, there's no maximum. I'm going to artificially say 65 just to focus the discussions. So we're not distracted by dementing illnesses and things. So somewhere Fine. between 35 and 65. And we know she's a woman. 
Yes. And my second assumption is that this person has no history of paranoid delusions or psychosis. I think the listener would have included that if the friend had been in treatment or in a hospital before. So Mm -hmm. onset is acute. Uh, The listener said her friend snapped. Uh, Sudden paranoid delusions in the setting of stress in, we're assuming, an otherwise healthy person. So there's a few things we could exclude in terms of developmental disorders. If If there's truly no prodrome, there's been no other symptoms. Um, It could be mood driven, so depression or mania, but I think those things would have jumped out at our listener, especially the mania. So I think we can probably exclude those. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have seemed so sudden. Yeah. That's right. And Faith mentioned Mm -hmm. the paranoid personality disorder. You know, it's possible people with that disorder have worsened symptoms during stressful periods. But Mm -hmm. I think, again, the caller would have mentioned that um, the person, you have to have symptoms at baseline if it's going to be a a personality disorder. So she would have said something like, well, she's always suspicious, guarded, paranoid, but things have gotten a lot worse lately. So I I think we can, you know, I feel pretty good about excluding that one. Sure. Sudden changes in otherwise healthy people always brings up at least a question of drug abuse. Mm -hmm. So stress can sometimes lead to use of new substances or increasing use of something they already use. I don't think that's what's going on here, but I just wanted to be complete and include that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think from a psychiatric standpoint, then the bucket we're left with is brief psychotic disorder. And the label's not very helpful, I'm afraid. It's very descriptive, right? It's just what it says it is. (laughs) Well, I think in the- for yourself. (laughs) I think it just replaced the good old nervous breakdown. So I guess it's maybe a little more descriptive, but- uh, Yeah. Again, I like classics. I think nervous breakdown, some like hysterical defense, some old time. Yeah. I mean, you know, we we probably got away from nervous breakdown, like a lot of things, because it wasn't terribly descriptive. But again, probably also following a trend, we didn't end up with something that was that much better. I think the unsatisfying part, though, is, of course, there's so many more questions than answers. So why do some people develop psychosis in the setting of stress? Does this person have a family history of psychosis? How have they handled stress in the past? That kind of gets to what you were just saying. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, is this just an exacerbation of something that she's experienced before? I'm assuming there's a lot of things going on. The person's probably not sleeping. Their life's been completely turned upside down. They have fears about the future, so they're anxious. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think you are doing a good job of talking about all the things that it's not or that it's likely not. I think often people think of schizophrenia as another illness that would come with paranoia. But again, that's something that would have a whole constellation of other symptoms and probably a prodrome and probably not be showing up when this person is between 35 and 65 years old. So, I mean, yet, right, we're looking at all these clues where, you know, a new onset of an illness is likely to occur. I guess the other thing that you want to make sure you rule out is medical illnesses, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think oftentimes we, because there's a psychiatric symptom, then you Mm -hmm. just assume it's a psychiatric problem. But, you know, just to be really obvious here, it's not common for a 35-year-old person with no psych history to have the sudden onset of paranoid delusions. So so whatever the Mm -hmm. cause, the person has a rare condition. And it's fine if it's a brief psychotic disorder, Mm -hmm. but there's no reason not to do a medical evaluation. If you're working on something that is rare, then you need to be open to many other rare things, including, you know, brain tumors, autoimmune disorders, endocrinopathies. Um, there's no history here. I mean, there's nothing in the question as far mm-hmm. as neurological problems. But yeah, an exam is going to be necessary, like some form of medical workup. This, you know, I think this person deserves. I would certainly want that for my family member. Mm-hmm. Um, that label of brief psychotic disorder is not very helpful. But diagnosis is important for prognosis. And yes can't even really offer much. Well, and it's one of those where we can say this is what it is now, but really the future is going to help determine the prognosis and maybe be able to secure a more stable diagnosis, which, you know, honestly would end up being a longer term problem. So maybe a brief psychotic disorder that occurs once and doesn't reoccur, which I want to say is like 10% of the time or something would be best case scenario. But Again, that's making a lot of assumptions and only time will tell. Yeah. And family history seems to dictate like if you oh, if yeah. for some reason you've had this as a result of stress and you have a family history of psychosis, or mm-hmm. if you've got some other comorbid psychiatric problem, you know, I think your chances of it happening again. Okay. So if we if we try to wrap it up, she's having a symptom of psychosis, a symptom of paranoia. We're trying to whittle it down into a more precise diagnosis, which as you said could be helpful, but I don't think we have enough information and 
some of these other things, including family history, substance abuse history, kind of other things might help fill out this presentation. But given what we know, which sounds like as much is as much as her best friend of 30 years kinds of knows, then we're going to have to move to treatment. And then maybe you can give an example of the speech you give families about, you know, why uh, it doesn't really matter what's wrong with her. We treat it all the same. I would never say that. I know you wouldn't. <laughs> It's like, no, it's like, it's like, oh, good news. Good news. Good news. This is, uh, this is a, a poorly defined problem that we are going to treat with a blunt instrument. <laughs> no? It's, it's, I thought I learned that speech from you. No. Yeah. No, I think that's right. Yeah. You're, you're mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. delivered with more panache usually, but, yeah. um, do you remember one time I wrote a PRN order when you were my attending and you disapproved of the dose, and you told me that I may as well have just written that the patient should pet a bunny three times a day. <laughs> Call me down. I don't, I don't remember that. <laughs> it's a true story. You probably said it a little more with a little more biting wit, uh, but it, but but the point was not lost on me. Yeah. So you learned something. You're welcome. I did. Yeah. May pet bunny three times a day is just <laughs> as effective as a whatever I wrote. I actually don't know what it was, but it was, mm-hmm. it was not enough. I was obviously not impressed. Yeah. With your, no. <laughs> with your dosing strategy. <laughs> you right. You, you got, you got so bored with criticizing me. You had to get really creative with it. <laughs> um, the, one, had... the one saved for when my, my self-esteem was in the tank. It was really helpful. Well, sometimes we got to break you down before we can build you back up. I'm still waiting for the building back up, but you <laughs> just, right. you alert me when it's going to happen. I'll perk up. It's any day now, soldier. Any it's any, it, is that okay? Okay. Yeah. I've just, I've only been waiting since 2006. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you kind of set up a segue. We can talk about interventions. Mm-hmm. I think that's really Please. what Faith was wondering about, right? I, yeah. I mean, she's worried about her friend. Yeah. So when I try to get somebody like this to engage in treatment, I, at least at first, I don't directly address the delusions. I address the impact of the stress from the delusions. So yep. things like, you know, you're going through so much, the stress must be overwhelming. Maybe it'd be helpful to talk to somebody. You, you know, the focus can be on getting help to cope with the stress, but you don't necessarily have to validate where that stress is coming from or challenge them on it. Right. I, I think the the major theme there is you have to dig in for the empathy it almost feels like parenting. You know, when you have someone, a toddler, or in this case, just a friend who's irrational, given the circumstances as you see it, but understanding it's their reality. So you just have to imagine, like, if this were really happening, how horrific they must be feeling. Like, how might you feel if someone were pursuing you and trying to kill you? And so I think if you could just frame your approach in that way, have empathy for what they're going through, and only focus then on the stress reaction about, mm-hmm. you know, it sounds like you really need to get some help for, for your sleep or because things have been so nerve wracking. You don't necessarily have to say this is because I, I think that you're crazy. I, and in fact, I would recommend against that. <laughs> um, but, right. And so I, I think I like this empathy approach. But what if um, I'm going to continue in this oral boards format? But, you know, what if the patient keeps doubling down and really focusing on the details of the people who are following her and out to kill her? Yeah. Like if they're trying to corner you about the delusion, like, like do you? Yeah. Do, or do that they, they really me? can't be led to talk about anything else. Right. Yeah. If you say, I think the problem is you're stressed about your divorce. And she says, I, are you kidding me? I can't even think about my divorce. Somebody's trying to kill me. Oh, no, I wouldn't right. even say the stress is from the Focus. divorce. I would just say, I would say that's horrific. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't imagine how you're dealing with that. Like, why don't you try to get some help uh, to dealing manage with, your day to day being, being pursued? Right. Pursued. I mean, without, without having to oh, okay. actually validate or state it or, okay, or anything. I do think though, if you start getting, you know, if the person starts to corner you about, do you believe me or do you not believe me? I think faith is actually doing a pretty good job in terms of trying to inject some logic, I think is how it was phrased. Yeah. What we tend to do is see if the person can do any of that on their own. And so I might say, is it possible these things are related to the stress of what you've been going through? Is it possible that there's other ways to interpret these facts? Um, Mm -hmm. Is it, is it just even within the realm of possibility that it was a coincidence that the blue van 
that was part three spots from the fence or, you know, or whatever that they're focused on. Right. That had your um, anniversary as its license plate numbers. Right. You, you want to see right. if there's like a, if there's, if the door is even open a crack to an alternative and that's what explanation. I was, yeah. Referring to as well, because I think that also helps with diagnosis and prognosis, right? Or at least points the intervention. And so someone who can't find a, a crack in it is in a very different position. Yeah. And I would say, yeah, it speaks to severity for sure. Yes. Like, uh-huh. yeah, you know, are they open to the possibility of of reality or are they not? And that's going to probably mm-hmm. dictate what happens next or what happens over the next few days or few weeks. Um, mm-hmm. And in those looking for those cracks, I mean, that's really just an adaptation from cognitive therapy as far as restructuring our assumptions. I will say there's times when I will be more direct, not to just say, you know, this is all in your head, but I might point out the absurdity of the logic. And you have to have like a pretty good connection with somebody, I think, if you're going to yeah. oppose them. But for example, I might point out a person's grandiosity to think that they're so important that the CIA, FBI, Department of Homeland Security, I mean, whatever, right. would go through this elaborate ruse, all this trouble, you know, spending mm-hmm. millions of dollars a day on putting these cameras in every place that you go. I mean, I just, I take the seed of what they're saying and unspool mm-hmm. it. And again, I don't challenge it. I try not to be judgmental. Like you're inviting them to defend the argument, at least. Right. And, and in the defense, you try to, again, you're just looking for those cracks um, mm-hmm. in the delusion. But you also, I mean, with anything, if you are, you know, seeing reality or even just taking the different side of an argument from someone, often, if, if you were to make the mistake of really refuting it and saying, you know, that's impossible. Nobody's out to kill you. This, this, you know, here's all the evidence against what you're saying. That would probably, she would just take the other side of the yeah, she could seesaw and, 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 yeah. and balance it and try to get defensive. Um, I mean, the, the death threat again, I feel like takes it probably leads her to be more alarmed and obviously more scared than some other types of delusions. But I also think sometimes there's a way to say, you know, how is this coming up? If this is all she talks about with her friends, like, has she been able to go to work? Are there other ways that this symptom, and again, you don't have to call it a symptom, but, you know, is there a way that the focus on all of these things around her is getting in the way of her living her life or getting in the way of other, her pursuing other goals or values that she has can sometimes I think, be a way to have somebody at least step outside of that and recognize other parts of their life that are going on. Again, depending on kind of how far down or how far gone she is with this line of thinking. Yeah. I mean, it'd be helpful to know, like, is she working? Is she still parenting? If she has children? Is she fulfilling other social obligations? Yeah. Or or is she holed up in her house? You know, which actually- If If this has taken over her life, then, you know, that, that last, uh, scenario that we were laughing at, hopefully not not in a bad way, but hopefully this doesn't come to a an involuntary hospitalization or being dragged away. But like if she's really not functioning, then that's that's a different type of intervention. Yeah. Well and and I want to bring up maybe to to close this, you know, yeah. we have to you have to talk about safety. Obviously. If you take the premise that you're being hunted and the intent mm-hmm. is being murdered, then you may kill yourself before someone else does just to alleviate Mm -hmm. the anxiety of what you believe is going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. Um, You may start making plans to, in your own mind, to defend yourself. So if these people are going to kill me, then I can kill them first and it would actually be justified. So I think that everybody who knows this person needs to be asking these kinds of questions. Like, are you, you know, are you looking to retaliate or do you think you need to have a plan? Like, what are you doing to prepare and to see? And it's not, yeah, it's not clear to me if, you know, if she thinks that it's like her friends out to get her, a specific person trying to kill right. her, or is it just random strangers, right? Because in that, I mean, that's a whole other discussion in terms of credibility or specificity of a threat. But if, you know, she is kind of pinning these accusations on actual individual people, then I think that is a, that's a higher level of alarm. What I'm trying to convey is not that it's any of her friends or family's job to try to sort all of that out. It's just to be aware of the fact that people who are paranoid sometimes act as a part of the delusion because it's internally Mm -hmm. consistent. I mean, if this is going to happen to me, then this other action makes sense. And so you just need to be aware that these people can, in fact, be dangerous. I'm not saying that the friend is. I'm just saying you have to have that on your radar so that you can get emergency 
intervention if needed. I mean, it's an emergency room, a crisis clinic, whether it's Mm -hmm. her going at the cajoling of a a friend or calling EMS or calling the police for a welfare check. I'm I'm just, uh, I just want to put that out there that, Mm -hmm. again, we don't have enough information, but safety should be on everybody's mind if you've got a situation like this. Yeah, I agree. And especially it sounds like anyone sort of confronting her even as gently as possible or trying to bring some of this up, if they get met with a an accusation of you're part of the conspiracy or you're after me too, then this person is likely to become increasingly isolated, which also feels dangerous. Yeah. So it's, I mean, this is serious. It's a big deal. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm sure there's, again, you've got so much stigma. There's a divorce Mm -hmm. going on. If there's custody of children going on, like there's so much more that is going to prevent people from seeking help or, or showing her mm-hmm. in a bad light. So, yeah, I mean, it's a terrible situation. Um, yeah. We just have a tiny bit of information about what's really mm-hmm. going on. So I don't know if this is helpful or not, but maybe. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, we I briefly mentioned medications. I mean, if this is a delusional disorder or even a brief psychotic episode, depending on the other symptoms, you know, antipsychotics may or may not be indicated, but you've mentioned insomnia a couple of times, Dave, that is, that could also be a hook. If there's a problem that she's willing to admit having, right, even if it's insomnia, I think that's a fine, that can be a fine way of like, okay, yeah, like, you know, you don't want to talk about the divorce. You don't want to talk about the rest of this, but what if you talk to a doctor to try to get some sleep? Like everybody feels better with some sleep. Yeah. Um, and there may be some like symptomatic treatments that kind of helps her through this even or maybe especially even if this is kind of a stress reaction. Yeah, yeah. I do the same thing. Try to find the right. hook. Try to be real symptom focused if that yeah. um, creates a little bit of an alliance. A lot of medications we can give you to make you sleep. So I'm some, saying, of them, yeah. some of them might decrease your uh, delusional intensity. So Yeah, there might there might be some uh, other side effects. But mm. they're, <laughs> they're called major tranquilizers for a reason. Again, that's, uh, you know, th- th- that's how you treat uh, nervous breakdowns and you're older than me. So I don't know much about that. <laughs> um, Back in the it, day when, yeah, the, when everyone was uh, collapsing under their fainting couches. All right. Well, listen, thank you again for writing in with your question. And we thank all of you for listening. Please send in your questions by email or an audio message at our website, callthepsychiatrist.com. We'd love to see you on Instagram and Facebook at Call the Psychiatrist. And if you've gotten any benefit from the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd write a review wherever you listen. Take care. Bye. Again, it's up to you. I really don't know if this is a great idea for you right now. Um, Let's just see what happens as an experience. Let's trust the process. Let's trust the process. Is that right? I, I, I learned from this podcast to never trust a therapist who says trust the process. Well, you learned something so good. You then. just, That's right. I know you blew, you blew your cover, Dave.